welcome to the QAA Membership Podcast. My name is Kerr Castle and I'm a Quality Enhancement and Standards Specialist here at QAA. In this episode, we discuss student transitions into college higher education with Leon Annett from Cardiff and Vale College and Jane Nickerson from Salford City College. Divided into three chapters, we start off by thinking about the identity of College HE and its learners. This is followed by discussion of the different opportunities around college higher education, specifically thinking about how transitions from further education to higher education are promoted and the different kinds of support available to students and staff. And finally, we focus on the importance of voice, developing networks and creating opportunities to share practice and experience with others in the sector. We hope that you enjoy this podcast, and if you'd like to learn more about our work around student transitions, visit qaa.ac.uk and search for Supporting Successful Student Transitions. So, thank you for joining us. Uh, Leon, would you like to kick things off and tell us a bit about yourself and what you do? Yeah, hi. Uh, so, it's Leon Annett. I'm the Dean of Higher Education at Cardiff and Vale College. Um, and my role is uh, to have um, strategic oversight of uh, higher education at the college. We've got, we typically recruit between five and 600 HE students each year. Um, and we've, we've got those across four of our sites. And uh, we, at the moment, we have four university partners and we also run HE provision with Pearson. So we will run anything from HNCs, HNDs, foundation degrees, to PGCE, BSc, and BEng. So it's quite it covers quite quite a scope, quite a range. Uh, and I've been involved in leading HE for about eight years now, um, and it's been about four and a half years at, at Cardiff Bell College. Thanks very much, Leon and Jane. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your work? Hi, I'm Jane Nickerson. I'm the Head of Higher Education at Salford College. Uh, Salford College is an urban college group with uh, five different centres. So I am strategic lead for all of the higher education over those different colleges. Um, And we have a range of provision from um, HNC construction that goes up to our uh, postgraduate certificate in education and everything in between foundation degrees, BA honours, BSc honours, Um, and a really diverse range of curriculum areas. We specialise in creative and digital uh, provision here with makeup artistry and media production, one of our specialist areas. We partner with uh, two different universities and also with uh, Pearson for our HE courses. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Jean. I'd like to start then by asking what college higher education or college HE is and what makes it unique? Yeah, I think, I mean, the makeup of college-based HE is very unique, um, and I think it's got its own distinctive characteristics, um, opportunities, and also uh, distinctive barriers as well. The emphasis has always been on widening participation and being there for the community, um, combined with um, all courses having vocational relevance uh, and work-based learning opportunities. I think it's important to note that the figures at the moment, you know, 10% of the UK HD population are taught in FE colleges now. So we're talking a significant number of students um, that we're we're impacting and working to progress. The unique selling point for me is higher level technical skills, uh, smaller class sizes, lower tuition fees in the main, and, and generally lower entry requirements. Uh, with a real focus on inclusivity and diversity. And what then do we mean by developing a college HE ethos? Jane, can I come to you for this one? Yeah, I mean, I think, as Leon said, um, all college HE is very unique, but I think what it is, is a a local and flexible alternative. It's a safe and familiar environment for our students. Um, Typically, not Um, exclusively but typically um, a lot of uh, college-based HE students are students who've already attended that college are familiar with that college they feel really comfortable with what that actually means to them and I think creating a true HE ethos in a college is very challenging both for staff and students to um, achieve I think it's typical that there will be 16 to 18s also within that college space for a lot of providers 
Um, and I think part of the ethos is to create some dedicated kind of university centre space that makes those students feel that they have a discrete opportunity there. I think part of that ethos is that the students just feel comfortable with the staff, with the curriculum, um, as Leo said, um, predominantly vocational provision. Um, and I think that ethos is just really creating that area, that um, aspirational environment so that those students feel that they can uh, succeed in exactly the same way should they be going to a large university. That That's a big, big sense of, of college-based HE, is that sense of belonging. I think it's important to just try to to drive aspirational levels amongst our students to say that you can achieve. Um, you know, we, we have many students that are uh, mature students, but we do also have students that progress directly from their A levels and B tech. And it's interesting because a, a student 18 may not be ready to go to university campus. So stay local, stay comfortable, um, stay inspired. The progression routes are still there. So, so when they come to 20, 21 years of age, if they want to then progress onto a top up at the university, or, or even indeed study for a master's, they're ready to do so at that point. Thanks, Leon. I think that nicely starts to answer my next question as well, which asks who college higher education learners are, but also how do they learn? Our students fall into three main categories really around higher education. There are students that do come directly from um, that A-level or that B-tech group, vocational students, um, quite often with quite a niche a vocational pathway in mind, whether that be construction or animal management or maritime studies or makeup artistry, but they know exactly what they want and they see that the resources that the college provides um, really meet um, their kind of that their industry requirement. So they're the young, energetic students that could actually choose to go to a university. They are eligible for that, but they actually really like what they see. And then we have our mature students who typically are trying to get back into that career. Um, kind of pull and they want to definitely upskill themselves and they see that a further education college is the right place for them and that's sometimes a self-esteem issue so they feel that maybe they're not quite ready for that higher level academic study and we are the absolute perfect place to welcome that kind of cross-section of student they learn in a different way they need more one-to-one support they don't necessarily fit comfortably in that large lecture theatre environment And then I think that final group of students are our uh, professional working students who are maybe coming back and studying on a part time basis. Yeah, at Cardiff and Vale College, the average age of our HE uh, population is 27. And uh, I think it's important we have a core curriculum that serves a number of different students, regardless of how they are uh, funding the course. You know, we've got many students who are in employment, so they're, they're employer sponsored. They may be receiving other forms of funding to be able to study on the course, that they're on the apprenticeship scheme and, and doing a higher apprenticeship or indeed a fee paying student as well. And the majority of our HE programs are on a f- full time course. They'll they'll be in two days per week. So there's a real high, high element, a big, big element of work based learning. But I think Jane's right. You know, many of the students will come to us. Uh, because it could be the relationships that we have, not just with the students, but with our employers as well. And we do offer that really, really bespoke um, and high quality pastoral care. With that mention of relationships, Leon, another aspect of this I'm really keen for us to pick up on uh, and discuss is the identity of staff. So can you tell me a little bit more about academic staff in College AG? Yeah, I I mean, our staff are outstanding academics. they can be delivering 25 hours of teaching per week, and it ranges from entry level programs all the way through to level six undergraduate. And the ability to be able to adapt their teaching styles throughout the day is a really difficult skill to master. Uh, they could be working with a range of awarding bodies as well. So um, giving them the space to be able to, um, to develop themselves as well on top of that is really, really challenging. So, you know, the majority of our Academics, they aren't just focused on higher level um, education. I know, I know that can vary from college to college, but, but for us, most of them, you know, will be a 50% split. So, um, so we do need to support them and there are various ways that we do that. So typically um, in college-based higher education, you know, staff have often been 16 to 18 A-level tutors. 
and then developed a particular skill to work on those higher level courses. They've probably been part of the validation team and taken a real interest in developing their students and preparing those progression routes for them with those subject specialisms. Um, you know, the staff in uh, college-based like HE uh, institutions typically are really close to their students and provide far more than just the academic support. Um, you know, they're also the first point of contact for many students. And I think that's part of one of our unique selling points, how close they really are to the journey of that, uh, the journey of that student. So moving on to the different opportunities around college higher education and thinking about how FE students typically encounter it, how can we better promote transitions into college HE and encourage that internal progression? For me, it's, it's simply about raising the awareness of what we've got to offer at the college, um, that it's distinctive. My concern is that too many students still don't know what we do. Um, you know, what college-based HE is. So we've got quite a challenge there. Uh, but it, for me, it boils down to a matter of choice. I don't think we should be competing with the universities for students um, because the students that want to go to the university are not our market. There are a range of things that we can do. Uh, certainly at Cardiff and Vale College, in my experience, you know, we have a lot of students that have uh, some form of imposter syndrome you know, really not feeling that higher level um, study is for them. So we do a number of things, uh, including progression weeks. So we have our uh, progressions team. They go out and they sp speak to a range of different curriculum areas about um, HE and, and really what it is and mapping out that pathway for them as well. We've recently introduced some transition to higher education modules as well that will just give students a feel of uh, the type of writing, the research skills, um, the critical thinking that that's that's needed on a level four program. Uh, the job opportunities, really opening up, you know, what's the benefit of the, of uh, studying a higher level course as well. So we we do a range of things throughout the year to try to prepare our students um, for for that higher level study. So as part of our kind of strategic um, approach to, um, I guess, promoting that transition into college-based HE, um, you know, we have a lot of students that are really hard to reach, students who are quite often the first in family to even consider higher level study. And I think a lot of our um, energy is focused on talking to our transitioning level three students in the community, both internally, we're a really large college group. Um, and through our kind of external partners, just to kind of reassure them that, you know, that journey is possible. And um, we have a really large adult student population as well. And a lot of those adult students become our higher education students. And very much as Leon said, building that belief in their ability to move to the next level. And that's something that I think colleges, we do really well. We really inspire that, that kind of confidence in their academic, you know, capabilities. They move forward. That idea of building picks up really nicely on my next question, Jane, which is how does it feel for students uh, and possibly staff too as they transition from FE to HE within the same college? Is there a complete difference or enough to make it feel distinct from their experience of further education? It's always a real challenge when students have been at the same college for a number of years for them to get excited about continuing their education while staying in the same building. Um, Many colleges do kind of dedicate a, a particular centre or a particular building or even a floor and make that the kind of university centre or the, the HE centre. And we've definitely found here that students like going to the university centre. That definitely gives them that sense that they have moved to a slightly different level and, you know, even just a different lanyard and a different set of tutors, their own little pop-up cafe, a dedicated learning space something that makes them feel that they have actually progressed um, themselves into that more adult journey. And I think there's lots of things that we can do to make them feel distinctly different. You know, for a lot of us, we don't have that space or that capacity to have a totally different building. But I think that that agency of space is really important to higher education students, that feeling that they're unsupervised, that feeling that they can be in the same place, but be different. Um, and I think it's absolutely critical to their journey that they feel that we approach them in a slightly different way. Absolutely agree with all of that, Jane. And um, it is about um, what a college is doing to create that sense of identity, that 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 it is higher level, recognising 
um, that these students are different than the, uh, the rest of the EFE college um, provision. And every EFE college does it in a different way. Um, we've got we have got different types of students uh, that are with us. We we have got different employers that we work with, geographical areas as well. Um, but I think fundamentally we need to do something that's different for these students. And I think that uh, creating a space that is for HE students um, only. Um, it is really a, one of the, the best ways you can do that. And there are other subtle things, as Jane alludes to there, things like lanyards. And, and, but, but I think that that physical space makes, makes a big difference. Yeah, and I totally agree. And I think it's also the feeling that, um, you know, even the academic calendar looks a bit different for those students, that it's recognised that things happen for them at a slightly different time. You know, we talk in semesters, you know, we don't talk in terms. It's important that it fits that kind of, that typical higher education student because their pals off at the local university, you know, they'll be on semester two or they'll be having their, their mid semester break. And, you know, they want that kind of language just to change slightly to reflect that they are a student at that level. Even things like, you know, we have a lovely, very little, but a lovely graduation for our higher education students here at the college. It's something that they really value. Um, because some of our partner universities um, will, you know, will welcome those students to graduate there, but not for all courses. And so I think it's really important that they feel that they get um, that really, really lovely opportunity to really feel like a, an undergraduate student. And how can we better support staff then to better support our students? Leon? Yeah, I mean, one of the th one of the things that we've been working on over the past year is identifying those areas how we can in which we can support the staff better so through some funding that we've received from welsh government we've developed some bespoke online cpd modules um, aimed at um, aimed at uh, upskilling staff so we've done that in a, in, in a range of areas one is collaborative interactive teaching and learning uh, we've also looked at a module in quality concepts and the implementation of VLE. So that depends and that changes depending on the universities that we're partnering with. Um, how to plan effectively for higher education delivery uh, and how to embed the outcomes of research because we do offer staff the opportunity to take part in some form of scholarly activity as well. And the final one is uh, effective course leadership. And that's um, linking with the university um, uh, or the awarding body, making sure that we're doing everything that we need to be doing correctly, but also supporting the students, um, considering we only see them once or twice per week. We are working on another module as well, and that's on bridging the gap. So again, really focused on transition. So how can we support staff to support students who are transitioning as well? So I think that that's a really, really good piece of work. I'm really proud of that because we've included a range of different curriculum areas um, you know, no, no one person has all of the answers to things like this. So it's nice to have a collegiate approach to it. And um, it, it's relatively new, but we've had a number of staff complete those modules already. Yeah. And I think that, um, you know, really deliberate and meaningful um, CPD for HE choosers is for us something that we found to be one of the single most important things to implement in, in a really large college. Um, so very regular CPD goes on for the subject specialisms, but we um, introduced, I introduced a range of uh, kind of discrete and bespoke CPD for all HE tutors, irrespective of how few or how many hours, you know, if they're fully deployed on HE courses or just partially deployed, that they have really meaningful, you know, some of those modules that Leon discussed very much around that um, kind of scholarly, scholarly activity, developing that academic understanding, um, but also giving them a really good understanding of what it means to be a registered provider of higher education, you know, understanding that office for students expectations, you know, the, looking very closely at the QAA, um, you know, the aspects of the quality code, which obviously we embrace so much. Um, and I think that for many of those tutors, they come into a college, maybe they're quite new to higher education teaching, even though they've got, you know, really fantastic industry knowledge. And I think it's for them to really, you know, quickly understand what it means to deliver HE to those students. You know, we do recommend that our staff take part in the um, Advanced HE Fellowship so they can really review their own practice. Um, and many of our staff actually go back out into industry 
as well and make sure that they keep themselves up to date both academically and with their very chosen you know industry specialism uh, yeah and i that's, that's that's brilliant and i think i don't know about you jane but at cardiff and vale college as well i think just the sheer presence of he and trying to drive aspiration levels from students is having an impact on staff themselves as well who are you know we've got a record number of staff at the moment who are studying towards a master's program towards um, even some uh, doctoral candidates as well so it's um it's raising the aspiration levels uh, for everybody you know because we're all we're all still learning. We're always learning. And the HEA fellowships is a big thing as well. And um, just raising awareness that this is something because this is not prominent in the FE sector at all. This is HE specific. So raising awareness to our staff that fellowships are, are a great opportunity. You know, we've gone from three to 25 in under four years, and that's in the middle of all this pandemic. So staff really want to improve their skills and they want to share it and um, have a much wider reach than just the college as well. So um, yeah, lots of great, great activities from staff who I think are just looking to improve themselves all the time. Yeah, and I think that, you know, we're even very fortunate in in our Northwest, re Northwest region to take that further and kind of engage in a lot of collaborative um, kind of professional development and academic development opportunities with some of our partner colleges. Um, and we've actually seen um, quite a lot of excitement with the uh, QAA enhancement projects that have been, um, you know, we've been working towards and lots of our partner colleges we've got in touch. We've got some really big ideas of how as a unit we can work together to support both our staff and our students. And that's something that we've never really done before as, as a sector. You know, we've all been quite separate, really. Um, and I think there's definitely, I've seen a move now to work together to know that we each have our own local students. And actually, you're not necessarily going to um, have any impact on those students if we work together more closely. It's just going to benefit all of them. You know, I would say 80% of our students are from underrepresented groups, maybe more. But we've all got slightly different underrepresented groups that are our area of expertise. And so I think it really helps us learn across the group how to support all of the students and for the staff to have a greater impact in that too. And the final question for this section then, which I'll direct back to you again, Jane, is what else might we do to enable student achievement once they're with us? I think what is really, really critical for students who come and study their higher education at college is to keep them really, really focused. For some of them, they are only in that academic mindset maybe 12 hours a week, maybe the two days a week that they're here with us, as Leon said, typically those students would just be with us a couple of days a week. They're not in halls. They're going to go back home. They're possibly going to look after their children, go and do their part-time job. They've got a really challenging life outside college. And I think what's a really critical role for us is to give them the tools to continue being an independent student when they leave us for those few days a week and that they feel that they can cope outside college as well as in college. I think quite typically uh, college-based HE students, they only feel comfortable when they're actually in the building. And when they leave us to go home, somehow that, that confidence kind of wanes a bit. So I think better supporting their achievement is to give them those tools to carry on with that learning outside. That, that For me, that's that's the number one area that we can succeed in. As Jane said, they're not on campus for very long as it is. Um, so one or two days per week and you throw in a pandemic, which means they're then not there at all. Um, has been really challenging for our students because, you know, the, the, the foundation degree or the degree that they're studying with us isn't the only thing in their lives. As Jane says, there's lots of other things going on. So, you know, the feedback from our students over the, the COVID pandemic is that, yeah, you've done online learning really well but we can't wait to get back onto campus. So we want that engagement with our peers. We want the engagement with the staff as well. Um, so it's just about, I think, you know, making sure that we're checking in with them. We're saying, you know, we're here for you. We can help you with this. We can help you with that. Uh, supporting their well-being throughout the journey because um, where we have lost students has been down to their well-being and their mental health. Yeah, and I think that for us, uh, very much, you know, as unique as all our institutions are, I think that a lot of the students, they feel that just passing is enough. That That's their aim. They just want to pass. And I think that, um, again, it's that encouragement to kind of really reach as far as they can to push themselves out of their comfort zone. 
you know, we regularly will put on additional academic study skills classes for our students to just help them become more confident because for the majority of them, they've got so much rich life experience. They can write outstanding pieces of work. They just don't believe in their ability to put it down on paper. So we really make sure that they feel um, that they can use those experiences to put that back into their assessed work. Obviously, to overcome some of the fear of exams, we do have courses that require a small level of examination. And that's often quite a big barrier for students. So again, you know, just very, very gradually building those skills up is another area that can help students achieve and, and really believe in their ability to go forward into their career. Uh, yeah, it's the same at Cardiff and Vale College. We we have some courses um, with the B Eng in particular, aircraft engineering. It's quite unique to us. So we get students are, are wishing to get the very best grade and we do get first class honours there. But in the main, absolutely, it's about, you know, it's um, positive and positive enough that they have ended up uh, enrolling on a HE course. So they they want to get through it. They want to qualify and they want to progress. So thinking a bit more about amplifying the voice of College HE, we've spoken already about sharing practice and experiences with each other and uh, taking a bit more of a collaborative approach. But what else do you think colleagues in the sector can do to make the most of these connections and any available support and resources? Yeah, I, I mean, first of all, I think that the um, the College HE toolkit is um, something that's really, really useful. Uh, and when when I got when I started with leading college based HE um, over eight years ago, that was a, a go to for me. It was a really, really good start, uh, and that was the the last version of that. So it's been updated since, and I think that's a really good. Uh, very informative, very helpful areas of good practice, case studies, you know, and, and just seeing how other people do it. I, I think um, sharing good practice is about, I think we should just reach out. Um, I, I reached out a couple of years ago to f- and visited five colleges in England um, in, in 2019, you know, and you start to create um, critical friends and, um, you know, you, you sort of share good practice and, and take, take bits. Oh, okay. That's, that's something that, I hadn't thought of using that at my institution. We all share that common purpose, don't we? And, and the types of students we have coming to us are similar as well. So it's nice to have a platform platform to talk about that because it's affecting a, a, a large volume of students now. Yeah, and I think that, you know, having, you know, similar to Leon led kind of college-based HE for about 10 years, um, you know, in a really, really large institution with a lot of higher education students with quite a formal structure in place coming to a much smaller institution with um, not quite such an established structure um, was a lot more challenging really sometimes I think you think smaller is easier but it actually isn't because there's a lot more to grow organically internally and I think that um, where things like using that college-based QAA toolkit you know educating everybody across the organization to understand exactly how important that regulatory framework is for higher education, irrespective of whether it's 70 students or 100,000, it's just as important. Um, And I think we've definitely reached out to other institutions to um, just see what they're doing, to learn some, um, you know, to learn some more effective ways to kind of do the same thing on a smaller scale and I think that it's really important that you do have that critical friend um you know there's a lot of requirements um within this regulatory framework and for really small colleges you know sometimes it's just one person who has to provide all of that governance information you know complete the access and participation plan understand all of those requirements um and I think it's really challenging to make sure that Absolutely, everybody involved in higher education understands that. And I guess as well, and and please do correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm imagining that you're not necessarily competing over the same students, or at least not always, with so much emphasis on staying local. Is there a greater opportunity to draw links between different communities and work together? I think that typically, not exclusively, that people will stay within a local postcode area. I mean, obviously in Greater Manchester, we have six, seven really, really large colleges that are quite close together. But depending on which side of the M60 you live, 
Um, you know, students will typically stay in their own area and they like to travel to what they feel they know and that is comfortable. Um, there will always be some provision that draws students uh, from a wider geographic area when you've got that really niche provision. But typically, I think you can work closely with your local partners and, and not actually... Um, encroach on anybody else's territory but make that provision better you know I'm part of a collaborative network looking at a new HTQ um, and there's six kind of local colleges and we know that there's a very small student kind of number that we're looking at but we all feel that we've got a slightly different way of approaching it but together we can make that much better for the students um, that the staff are engaging in really meaningful scholarly activity with like-minded academics who understand like you say the nature of that student and for us, we only see it as an, a fantastic development opportunity, definitely not anything that's going to compromise our, our, our journey. Yeah, and I think um, I mean, there is a fine line between um, competition and collaboration. You know, we recognise that and there will there will be a small element of that, uh, just given the nature of what we're delivering, obviously. And uh, in Cardiff, we do have um, a number of universities right on our doorstep. Um, but I, I'm part of, we have a College Wales HE network um, attended by all the, the, you know, we have a representative from all of the colleges. We have uh, QAA, uh, are also QAA Wales are, are there as well, and HEFQ. And we do meet um, only a couple of times per year, but we do discuss all of the challenges because we are all sharing those challenges in Wales in, in the domestic market. But I would not say at any point do we feel that we are competing against the other colleges at all. Um, and I do think the majority of our students, um, you know, they, they are local um, and, and they, they choose to study with us because of the locality, uh, because of the good experience that they've had studying with us in the past as well. Um, but like Leon says, you know, we have, you know, AOC Regional Forum, we have a Northwest group, you know, we have the QAA college based sessions. And I think, you know, they are so useful for practitioners, especially when there's maybe just one or two of you with that HE knowledge in an institution and you, you have to take that load for the, the whole, you know, the whole college. I think without those networks, you would feel um, that it was much more challenging to overcome some of those really critical conversations. Thanks, Jane. And for my final question then, just thinking about everything that we've discussed, uh, if, if you could have the listener leave with one key takeaway today in terms of how they think about or appreciate college HE, what would that be? You know, the unique the uniqueness of what we deliver it, it's not on duplicating provision. Um, you know, we do have to align ourselves to what employers want, what the, the demand is there um, and ensuring that there are progression routes for all of the students. It is about raising aspirations. Um, and I mentioned before about the imposter syndrome. You know, our staff have it as well. So it's recognizing that, you know, our staff have some excellent qualities. Um, to be able to deliver higher level uh, qualifications. And it is about preparing our students for where they're going next in, in their careers, in their lives. Um, and, you know, taking on board all of the softer skills, because, you know, you, you can't underestimate how valuable that they are um, in, in people's lives and, and obviously in employment as well. So it's just preparing our students the best we can um, students that wouldn't normally go to university and we're just you know we're, we're attracting those and we're progressing them yeah and I think it's that you know believing in yourselves as a provider just believing in that the job you do makes a difference to those lives and if you weren't there delivering that higher education some of those students would never access it they would never dream of making that step and I think that's what we do so well we bridge that gap Thank you so much to Jane and Leon for joining us today. As mentioned at the top of the podcast, if you'd like to find out more about QAA's student transitions work or any of the resources mentioned in this podcast, like the College HE Toolkit, simply visit qaa.ac.uk. Thank you for listening in. We really hope you enjoyed the conversation and look forward to sharing more content like this with you soon. Mm -hmm.